There's Jared, okay. And then more. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you doing? So I don't think you need any introduction to the audience because most of the people already know you. Uh, Dr. Jared Gardner is a close friend and also an associate professor of pathology currently working at Geisinger. Uh, he speaks like he's an expert not only in soft tissue pathology but also in dermatopathology. And he's taught a lot like everybody has learned from his lectures on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook. So a lot of teaching that he does. And so we will also benefit from his great uh, teaching techniques today. And uh, the floor is up to you, Jared. Now you can All right. begin All right. your talk. Thank, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Raj. And uh, what an honor to be here presenting alongside so many uh, incredible speakers from all over the world. Really it's so cool to see this meeting come together in such a short time, uh, thanks to amazing effort on uh, Raj and uh, Dr. Linskaya and the other members of the organizing committee. And a special thanks to Raj and his team for making uh, Path Presented this wonderful website that we can share some of the coolest, most interesting cases um, with people around the world. I just love that. And you know, when I was in training just a little over a dozen years ago, there was nothing really like this at this level. Um, and to be able to teach and learn this way is wonderful. And oh, you guys know who I am. And even though it says approach to soft tissue neoplasms, it's going to be a little more like a random bone and soft tissue cases, OK? Um, uh, people have been asking me for a long time to make a how do you approach soft tissue tumors. And I've not done it yet because it's really hard to, to do it, to put it all together and, and have a structured, organized approach. But it is on my to-do list. And maybe one of these days, I'll get around to it. All right, so here's the first case that we have. Uh, today. This is um, an upper, um, an arm mass deep in the muscle that in a uh, like a 25 year old woman and it grew quickly over a period of a month or two and was quite painful and tender and swollen. And so this is an incisional biopsy. It's a, 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 a pretty large piece that they took out of the lesion but not, did not remove the entire lesion. So let's look at what we're dealing with here. From, from first, uh, even at low power, I think you recognize there's bone right? We see bone everywhere. But this on uh, imaging study, it was actually in the soft tissue and not in the bone or attached to the bone. And that's a really important question to ask anytime you think that you have um, something that is, it has bone in it or cartilage in it, you want to know, is it actually um, touching the bone or is it totally in the soft tissue? All right. So let's take a look at some of the areas here. We've, it's a very busy lesion. There's a lot going on. So it, it's kind of a uh, uh, kind of overwhelming to look at. So we got to break it down a little bit. First, the outside here is got a nice like layer of bone here that's all um, woven together. And it is it is woven bone. You can see at higher power. There's uh, irregular little lines of, of um, cartilage, I'm sorry, of um, collagen there that are forming the osteoid. And you can see a, a very, you know, puffy, juicy, um, a large, osteoblastic cells that are around the periphery of these little bone um, seams of osteoid and also embedded in the center of them. And they're very large and, and uh, they really stand out. It's very cellular around, uh, around all of the bone, okay? So that's what we're seeing at the edge of the lesion. And then also look at this stuff out here. We'll look at it over on the other side, it's better. Look at that, that's skeletal muscle with tons of edema, right? Each individual skeletal muscle fiber is kind of splayed apart by this edematous, loose background and kind of is becoming smaller and a little bit atrophic. So there's a lot of reactive change in edema in the skeletal muscle. Then there's this layer of very robust, um, brisk osteoblast proliferation with woven bone. And then as we get towards the middle here, um, the the bone is still there, but the cells don't look quite as big, right? It, there's still kind of some large osteocyte or osteoblast cells um, around lining the outside of the bone and in the middle of the osteoid, but they're not as big and as uh, juicy. Um, I like to use that word a lot. It means big and puffy uh, as these ones at the edge, right? So it kind of changes as you go from the outside to the inside of the lesion. There's also some scattered giant cells here. And remember, anytime that you've got some bone formation, um, bone formation or bone breakdown, you're going to get osteoclasts that are going to come and hang out and be there for the party, right? So that's, um, that's what's going on there. In the center, we've got this kind of cellular spindled area with some kind of loose edematous backgrounds. 
And then, wow, what in the world? Look at that crazy island of cartilage with huge nuclei. Uh, pretty scary looking, right? If you've not seen cartilage like this before um, and know the trick here, which I'll tell you in a minute, you're gonna get really worried, okay? So um, when you see really bizarre, weird looking cartilage, the first things I think of are not chondrosarcoma. Number one, if it's in the bone and the right radiographic and clinical setting, I think of chondroblastic osteosarcoma where the cartilage can be pretty atypical. The other thing, and the thing I see more often is reactive cartilage. Reactive cartilage, like at a fracture site or repair of bone um, adjacent to another like lytic lesion that's caused a fracture, something like that, you can get really wild, bizarre looking chondroblasts or chondro, excuse me, chondrocytes, um, cartilage cells. And so this, even though these look really wild, uh, don't get uh, too worried about it yet, okay? We gotta put all the pieces together, but there's more of it here. There's a lot of weird looking cartilage, okay? Now, let's go uh, to the next slide here. Here's another area from the same, the same lesion. There were several different blocks. This one looks quite a bit different. We are, um, we are, you can see the skeletal muscle here with a lot of atrophy, the tiny little shrunken and splayed apart skeletal muscle fibers. Then this kind of loose heterogeneous spindle cell area with a lot of mixoid, loose mixoid change in the background, some little foci of kind of almost cystic mixoid change. And uh, here and there in the midst of this, you'll see a little bits of islands of that osteoblastic rich, uh, large osteoblast concentrations forming some little um, foci of osteoid. And I think there's more of it up here. You can see again, the atrophic muscle, this loose mixoid spindled area, and then osteo, uh, osteoid production here, okay? So when we put all this together, um, the uh, one thing we would want to get ideally is some radiographic information and clinical, okay? So I, I usually try uh, to look at, this is true for derm path and bone and soft tissue. I try to look at the slides first, think of all the possibilities it might be, and then figure out the clinical and the radiographic to see if it matches up with what I think on pathology. So I figure that gives me the, the most open mind to approach a case uh, and, and kind of to avoid being biased. Um, although I always tell, you know, surgeons and, and treating physicians should never worry about not biasing us by, by depriving us of clinical information. That's wrong. Um, but I do in voluntarily do that to myself. When I first look at a case, I find that I work best that way. And also sometimes I'm spectacularly wrong. I think it's something and then I look at the clinical and I'm like, there's no way this fits. But I learn something every time that happens and realize, oh, this thing can mimic that other entity. So there's just a general pearl for how to approach pathology, at least uh, in my way. And I, that's still how I do it in practice most of the time. All right. So when we, uh, when we approach this, um, this is a lesion, actually, I'm going to skip past the next slide for one second. We'll come back to it. Here on the left is what this lesion looked like around the time of biopsy. You can see, even though it looks like it's connected to the bone, from an alternative view, you can see it's actually centered in the soft tissue. It's a ring of bone with a kind of lucent center, but a rim of uh, radio-opaque bone, mineralized bone around the outside, like a shell, an eggshell of bone. And so when you have that in the middle of muscle, and then when you see on pathology, stuff that looks like loose mixoid, almost like nodular fasciitis with this loose mixoid cystic change and then atrophic muscle. And then you see a shell of reactive bone being laid down around the outside. That is perfect for myositis ossificans, okay? And that is what this is. This is like one of the most robust cases of myositis ossificans that I've seen. And if you are looking at this and thinking, I'm crazy, how could this possibly be a benign thing? You're not alone because the first time I saw a recut of this when I was uh, um, Dr. Weiss's fellow, I brought the slide to her and I was like, how is this not a sarcoma? Please teach me. And over the years, I've gotten a little bit more comfortable with it, but it still does look wild and scary sometimes, especially on a small biopsy, if you get the wrong area. The key to this is the clinical scenario, right? This rapid growth, and then the shell of bone around it on imaging. And microscopically, what we see it, uh, correlates with that, that appearance. The center of the lesion is composed of loose fasciitis-like um, uh, myofibroblasts. Sometimes they can be pretty big and weird looking. They can have those big ganglion-like cells that you see in proliferative fasciitis and proliferative myositis. They can have a lot of overlap. 
And then they have a, an organized zonal kind of layer of bone around the outside. And a, a lot of times you'll see this kind of reactive cartilage too, that's, that's turning into the bone, right? It's starting as cartilage and then it's um, being uh, converted into bone over time, right? It's similar to what you see at like a fracture callus site. So because all of this looks so reactive, in the past we've always thought that these were reactive lesions, just like nodular fasciitis and other fasciitis family entities. In more modern times, we've recognized that these probably represent transient self-limiting neoplasms, benign neoplasms, because just like nodular fasciitis, the majority of cases have gene fusions involving uh, MYH9 and US, uh, UPS6 uh, genes. So the, uh, the presence of, uh, of those genes um, can be really helpful, and it has been discovered that the same translocation is found in the majority of cases of myositis ossificans um, and a closely related entity to this that occurs on the finger, which is called fibrosseous pseudotumor of the digit. So it's good to know about that because it has all the features we're showing right here in this case, but it's on the finger. And it's important to know about these entities because if you're not aware of them, you can easily make the mistake of thinking that this is an osteosarcoma, right? Because you got atypical cartilage and these big, very large um, osteoblastic cells and their large cells getting embedded in the middle of the osteoid and it looks very scary, right? And of course, like, like nodular fasciitis and other fasciitis family of things, you can have a lot of mitotic activity, okay? So the key is seeing that that's this kind of zonal shell and that as you go to the middle, I think the next piece actually represented some of the middle of the lesion you find that actually what you have there is the kind of loose fasciitis-like spindle cell proliferation. But again, I mean, these are big, weird-looking myofibroblasts, right? That's what happens in some cases of fasciitis um, and other reactive settings. And, and reactive settings that have the fasciitis-like appearance can also have these large, kind of almost ganglion-like, you know, like a little eyeball staring back at us. Um, and those can look quite scary, okay? So um, in hard cases, you can send it for the USP6 uh, gene uh, uh, rearrangement study if you want. If it's positive, that's very supportive that this is a benign process in the fasciitis family. But if it's negative, it doesn't exclude uh, that possibility, all right? And um, that is a good example here. Now, what is really cool about this case, aside from the fact that we've got such a nice big piece of this to look at, is that we have follow-up, okay? So this was taken out and then they, once the diagnosis of uh, myositis ossificans was rendered, they decided to wa watch and wait and see what would happen if the lesion would shrink down because on scans, there was a lot of edema and swelling around the lesion. So they thought they would let it calm down and kind of resolve. And then whatever was left over afterwards would go and surgically remove it. So this is what it was like at biopsy. And it was finally excised about, fully excised about nine months um, after this biopsy. And here's what the excision looks like. Whoa, totally different. We still have this shell of bone. We still have a loose spindled area in the middle, but let's go take a closer look. The bone has now started to convert and organize and remodel into actual lamellar bone. See, there's lamellar bone lines, all that crazy busy woven bone that we saw at the beginning. Nine months later, it's starting to look almost like the bone of a normal, like, you know, one of our normal long bones. Pretty amazing, right? And you can see that around it, the soft tissue may still have a little bit of edema, but nothing like that massive edema and skeletal muscle atrophy that we saw in that other. There's still a little bit. The skeletal muscle is not totally back to normal, but it definitely does not look as irritated and as edematous and atrophic as it was in the other original specimen. And then in the middle here, most of what used to be that brisk, spindled, um, myofibroblast-rich area has now turned into either loose kind of fatty tissue, or in the middle, it's kind of resolved down from what is basically like those, the fasciitis, like areas I think of as being kind of akin to granulation tissue, right? There's a lot of overlap between granulation tissue and fasciitis. And just as granulation tissue eventually kind of calms down and turns into a more collagenized, less cellular scar, in normal wound healing, you can see a similar process happening in fasciitis as it resolves. So this used to be that very cellular mitotically active area, and now it's calmed down into basically some loose collagenized scar tissue with some hemosiderin left over. So it's really cool, I think, to be able, I, I, this is the best example I've seen of this where we get to see the outcome of what happened 
later. And there's some cystic areas that are like, like kind of seroma almost filled with blood and serum. But this is what the final result was. And it's really cool to see how it goes from that very cellular scary looking lesion to this very obviously benign uh, lesion here, okay? So let me show you the radiographic images. So that one right here, this is um, an early uh, x-ray either, I can't remember if it was at or right after the time of biopsy, but you can see the ring of bone. Look what happens over time. I know it looks larger here. I think it's because I zoomed the, you can see how the, the, um, the, the humerus is wider here than here. It's because I zoomed in too much. So that's my fault. Um, radiology fail on my part. But you can see the mass now is a lot more uh, opaque. There's a lot more dense bone here. Here, there was a lot of more immature osteoid and not as much mineral. Here, it's very mineralized and turned into more mature bone. So you can see that happen over time. This was taken, I think, about uh, maybe six months after the original uh, diagnosis, a few months before it was finally taken out, I think. Um, and then here was... Um, here are some uh, MRIs and you can see at the top, this was actually a couple months after the original biopsy. And so there is some post uh, procedural change here, but there's a ton, here's this like a loose edematous area in the middle, the little shell of bone you can vaguely see around here, but there's tons of edema in the background, uh, skeletal muscle. And then look what happens six months later or so when they scanned it uh, preoperatively, you can see that the edema has all calmed down. It's kind of shrunken down and started to resolve. So really cool to have this like uh, this uh, uh, ability to correlate between what it looked like originally and what it looked like as it matured over time. And here's just another view um, showing kind of the contrast of what we started with. I guess this could be like a nice meme online, like how it started and how it's going. So uh, it's a nice case to remember. And if you, haven't, if you haven't had a chance to study this slide yet, I encourage you to go on the Path Presenter and pull this up and look around carefully at this slide because the more you study scary looking reactive things and scary looking fasciitis like things, the more prepared you'll be to deal with those in real life when you get a challenging biopsy and you're trying to decide is this cancer or not. Because it's a very, very difficult uh, dilemma sometimes. And I've even in practice, I've one of the mistakes I made early in my career after doing a fellowship is I called something a sarcoma and it ended up being a proliferative fasciitis, a very robust example. And I debated, but in the end, I thought it was malignant and, um, and more expert people than me saw it and said, no, we just think it's fasciitis. And uh, no one got hurt. And I learned a great lesson from that, that even no matter how much training you have, it can still be really challenging to deal with fasciitis-like things and reactive things versus neoplasia. And one of the things Dr. Weiss told me in fellowship was that that was one of the main goals of the fellowship was to be able to sort out reactive and fasciitis family of things from neoplasia because it can be really challenging. So, so go study that and learn the features and see just how wild benign stuff uh, in the myofibroblastic category can look. Oh, another picture. I See, I, I really like this case. I couldn't get enough of it. All right, now, uh, case uh, number two. So this is a small lytic lesion in one of the phalanx bones on the finger of a, of a young adult patient, okay? And as is often the case with bone, uh, we got uh, multiple curette fragments, all right? On imaging, this was a lytic lesion on an x-ray and on, um, on uh, MR, it was clearly a cartilaginous lesion. So a lot of times preoperatively, the orthopedic surgeon has a good idea that something may be a cartilage lesion. Every once in a while, the radiologist thinks something will be cartilage and it ends up being something not cartilaginous that has maybe a lot of myxoid background that has that similar signal intensity as cartilage. But usually the radiologists are very good and the orthopedic surgeons very good at recognizing when something's gonna be a cartilaginous uh, bone tumor, all right? So the fragmentation of cartilage specimens, and I'll, I won't lie to you, cartilage tumors are not my favorite thing because a lot of times they're low grade cartilage things and I've got a bunch of fragments and sorting out enchondroma versus chondrosarcoma on low grade specimens can be very, very challenging if, if not impossible sometimes because a lot of the features of helping us decide if something is a, a low grade, well, what used to be called grade one chondrosarc and is now sometimes called atypical central cartilaginous tumor in the new WHO in the long bones, um, it can be mostly based on the growth pattern, right? Is it infiltrating and entrapping normal bone or is it breaking out of the cortex and invading the soft tissue? Those are malignant features, okay? But um, in long bones, you have to be very, very careful even with low grade cartilage uh, because it's very difficult to tell um, uh, benign versus malignant or, or atypical, okay? 
And the important distinction here, um, and I have a video on my YouTube channel uh, that Andrew Rosenberg sat down with me, and he's an amazing, just a master of bone pathology, a wonderful teacher. And he talked through some of the things that can help sort out in chondroma of bone versus chondrosarcoma low grade. Okay, so um, in that, um, and in any case, though, the, the features in the long bone, the way you approach a cartilage tumor, is different than how you approach it in the small tubular bones of the hands and feet, okay? In the hands and feet, chondrosarcoma is exquisitely rare. I've seen a handful of cases, but very, very rare, all right? I, what I always tell my residents is you should not make a diagnosis of chondrosarcoma or osteosarcoma in the hands and foot unless you're a bone and soft tissue pathology expert. And even still, I do it with great trepidation uh, because um, I know how rare it is and I want it to be absolutely definitive either on pathology or ideally on radiology, okay? So this lesion here is cartilage, but it's a lot more cellular than a normal cartilage looks like and more cellular than an enchondroma in a long bone would look like, right? We've got an increased density of the chondrocytes. And it's, I always find it hard to evaluate chondrocytes for atypia because they usually are kind of small and very dark, uh, hyperchromatic nuclei look almost like black, you know? And so it's very hard to see anything in there. And sometimes the stroma or the, or the um, cytoplasm um, can pick up extra stain and make it harder, even harder. So um, I feel like uh, the H&E stain in different labs can produce a very different appearance on the same block of the same cartilage tumor. Sometimes it, the, the matrix material really picks up the hematoxin very strongly and other times it doesn't, okay? So um, just keep that in mind. But in any case, this is cellular. There's a bit larger, a little bit more atypical cells. So you might get a little worried about this, but again, radiographically, this was a small lesion confined to the bone and it's in the fingers, in the hands and feet. A chondroid lesion is going to be benign until proven otherwise, okay? So even if it's cellular, even if it has atypia, if it's radiographically um, not, not obviously destroying the bone invading soft tissue, then I'm gonna call that an enchondroma, okay? Now, if it does destroy the bone and invade soft tissue, or if it has obvious permeating, infiltrating growth and trapping normal bone, which is very, very difficult, if not impossible to see on a curatage specimen, you know, but if it has those obviously malignant growth patterns, well, that's a different story. But again, I encourage you to get consultation uh, with an expert in bone and soft tissue before ever rendering a diagnosis of chondrosarc or osteosarc in the small bones of the hands and the feet, okay? It does happen, it's just very rare. And what very well may happen to that patient is an amputation or partial amputation. So a lot is on the line uh, for patients in that setting. So this was a benign enchondroma of the uh, finger. Really nice example. And oh yeah, I didn't point out, sometimes you can get little, little islands of calcification uh, and little bits of bone in the background of, the, of cartilaginous lesions. Both benign and malignant ones can do that. But see how cellular it gets? Kind of scary looking, right? but it's benign. And I don't have a radiograph of this one to show you, but it was benign radiographically. Now, let me turn this around here. This is something that you'll rarely see for several reasons. Number one, this is a cartilage tumor here. This used to be the bone, the cortex of the bone, but this cartilage tumor is not behaving in a friendly manner. Look at it. It is destroying the bone, destroying the cortex, invading aggressively into the soft tissue outside of the bone. Obvious invasion. This is a really perfect section here, cut very nicely by some awesome histotechs. And when you look in the bone itself, you can see this is normal bone here, right? Or it used to be. It's got lamellar bone lines, right? So when you see lamellar bone with the little bone lines there that are all parallel, you know that that is either, it's either cortex or trabecular bone that's normal. It's not being produced by the tumor. When tumors make bone, they make woven bone, okay? Maybe it can mature eventually, but when, when a tumor starts out making bone, new bone is woven bone. Um, and in here we have this island of bone completely surrounded by cartilage tumor. And the cartilage tumor also has, look at all the necrosis, tons of single cell necrosis. I'm not 100% sure if that always means malignancy, but I am very worried when I see individual chondrocyte necrosis to any extent in a cartilage lesion, because when I've seen that before, usually on a larger sample, those ended up being chondrosarcoma. So I get very worried when I start seeing obviously necrotic chondrocytes, all right? 
I don't make a definitive diagnosis of malignancy based on that alone, but on a small biopsy, that's a feature that concerns me. We also have extensive myxoid change to the matrix here. All the bone is being completely permeated. This is a perfect example to burn in your mind of what permeative growth looks like. The problem, of course, is yes, it's easy to see it here because this is an amputation specimen. So we can take a huge slab of bone and the adjacent tissue and see everything. When you don't have a, set, a specimen like this and you just get some curette or a needle biopsy, it's much harder or it's impossible, like I said. And that's when you really have to work closely with your radiology colleagues. And also remember that just as pathologists, some pathologists have a lot of expertise in bone and soft tissue tumors, and some have very little experience. The same is true for radiologists. Just because they look at bones, um, uh, all of them have training in bones, doesn't mean that all of them have seen a lot of bone tumors or soft tissue tumors, because those tumors are rare for us and for radiologists. So if you have the, the privilege of working with or near a musculoskeletal radiologist, someone who's done a musculoskeletal radiology fellowship, that can be priceless. And in really hard cases, sometimes I've always been lucky to have one or more awesome MSK radiologists work with me where I can consult them on cases if, if they're difficult. But if you don't have that, see if you can get the imaging study sent out to be reviewed by an expert, because that can also be helpful, just like getting the pathology reviewed by an expert. So just keep that in mind. And if you don't have a close relationship with your radiologist, fix that. Because I can't tell you how many times my radiologists have really helped me on a hard case, either save me from making a mistake or help me to see a nuance that helped me put the pieces together and figure out the right diagnosis for the patient. So I, I rely very heavily on them, especially in bone pathology. Do not do bone pathology without radiology support. You have to at least have a radiology report um, available to you, or ideally um, be able to see the images yourself. And if you can't, then you really are limited in the amount of information you can provide. And if I have a case where I really just cannot get that information, which is extremely rare, but I've had that before with some consults in the past. And there are times where I'll say, well, here's what I see, but I really don't know what to make sense of this because I don't have any radiology information. So um, in any case, I've not had to do anything like that for a long time. The other thing here is look at the cellularity. This is very cellular and the cells are enlarged and atypical and they're kind of spindled. So I know we saw some areas that look kind of like this in that last cartilage case, but again, in a small benign uh, growth pattern lesion in the small bones of the hands and feet, totally fine to see stuff like this. In a long bone, that's atypical, but here we actually are in the foot. I forgot to tell you that, this is in the foot. So even though if I just had this in the middle of the bone and it was benign in its growth pattern, I'd be okay with areas, even though that looks really weird. But once I see it permeating through the normal bone, destroying the cortex, invading the soft tissue, this is chondrosarcoma. Doesn't matter if we're in the foot or the hand. This is definitely chondrosarcoma here. And this is the, one of the only times I've ever seen chondrosarcoma and epidermis on the same slide because this was extending so far out of the bone that the section actually was able to see skin all the way down to bone. Pretty unbelievable, very unfortunate case. This patient lost their foot. This was uh, some years ago, uh, and I'm not sure what the final outcome was, but I hope that the patient did well. All right, so this is a good example of chondrosarcoma. I would, uh, personally on this, I would probably call it grade two. I think the grading of chondrosarcomas is, is somewhat subjective, but um, once I start seeing stuff that looks pretty atypical, cellular spindled, then I would call it grade two. Grade one to me, uh, well, you can go read the new WHO. It's kind of complicated, and I think that it's, and they've changed a lot of things. And so I would, uh, it's too much to go into in this video, but in any case, I would call this a grade two chondrosarcoma. I think that's actually what it did call this, if I recall. And let me show you now some uh, very dramatic gross images. This is a really uh, great section. I think that we froze the foot, if I recall in this case, in a, in a minus 80 freezer. Um, if you're lucky and have like a diamond tip saw, you can uh, cut and not have to do that. But I feel like you have a band saw Freezing um, seems to work really well. I used to be really worried about doing that. I was afraid it would like cause freezing artifact in the cytology, but um, over time I've been re really convinced if you freeze it rapidly in, in a minus 80, um, you'll, you can cut right through it with a bandsaw and the histology usually comes out beautifully afterwards. So you can see here, the I can't remember which actual bone in here it was arising from, but it's completely destroyed the bone bulged all the way out in the soft tissue, growing in between the other bones. There was no way, unfortunately, to extract this tumor without removing the foot. And here's another view closer in to see the uh, different bones in the ankle. And then one final view. You can see the glistening uh, appearance and the multilobulation that's very typical of cartilaginous uh, tumors. So again, I've only seen a few of those over time. So they're very rare, but they do happen. All right. 
this is another lesion from the foot. A mass on the plantar foot, slowly growing over a few years and it is kind of painful, so they took it out. When we go in here, let's look at the pink stuff first. Look at this. This is dense regular connective tissue. Very, very dense pink collagen, bland little fibroblasts in between. And look at those waves there. Very wavy. Too wavy to be nerve. If you've watched any of my videos or heard me talk before online, you know I love to talk about that if it's ultra wavy, it's usually not nerve. Very, very wavy like this that looks almost like ramen noodles or instant noodles when they come out of the package dry. Oh, I see. Yes, uh, Dr. Ogilinskaya just put in the chat ramen. You are totally right. This is the ramen noodle sign, which tells you something is dense regular connective tissue, tendon, tendon sheath, fascia, ligament, any of those. Or in the setting of a neoplasm that has this kind of pattern, you could think of neural, but what I think of first is actually fibroblastic differentiation because fibroblastic lesions tend to have similarities to this and they kind of shrink up and it looks like ramen noodles, okay? Or like an accordion, if you like, uh, whatever, whatever works for you. But I like the ramen noodle sign in honor of my former fellow, Dr. Ed Fulton, who came up with that and I thought it was brilliant. So why is it important to focus? I, I always like to teach this normal histology stuff because sometimes that tells you a lot about not maybe the surgeon gave you the anatomic site, but this can tell you a lot about how deep you are, where exactly you are. We know here we are down deep, right? We are down at the tendon sheath level or, or deeper, okay? And coming off of this, we have a kind of cellular, kind of blue tumor. It's arranged in kind of multiple nodules here. And when we go closer, where's the area I wanted to show you? The spindle cells, even though they're a little hyperchromatic, I think part of that in this case was that uh, we were having a little bit of uh, trouble with the H&E and it was staining things a little darker. So I know the nuclei do look a bit darker here. But uh, aside from that, the cells are kind of mon monotonous and uniform. And look at how they run in the biggest fascicle you can imagine. Like they're all running the same direction in parallel, right? If this were like a highway or a, or a big uh, you know, road with cars on it, it would be like 100 lanes wide, right? It'd be like the biggest, widest road in the world, all right? So that very broad sweeping fascicles of bland spindle cells um, and the fact that the spindle cells, look, a few of them touch each other, but most of them are not touching each other. They're divided by pink bundles of fine, delicate collagen in between. So those features together is characteristic of fibromatosis, okay? In the deep soft tissue, when you see this pattern, you think of desmoid fibromatosis. In the hands and feet, you think of palmo, palmar or plantar fibromatosis, which has similar features, but is a lot smaller, is, is not as problematic um, as desmoid fibromatosis from a symptom perspective. And it seems to be driven by a different process um, than um, desmoid fibromatosis, but they have a microscopically lots of similarities. So once you know what desmoid tumor looks like, you can kind of apply those same principles to looking at uh, these, okay? So uh, here's another area where you can see the broad sweeping fascicles. And here's more over here. Look at that, like the entire screen, all of the fibroblasts are running the same direction. And I say fibroblasts, but actually a lot of times these will have some actin expression. So fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, I don't know the, the molecular biology, but I'll tell you that from a morphology perspective and an immunostain perspective, fibroblasts and myofibroblasts tend to exist on a spectrum. And many lesions that we call fibroblastic will have some actin staining. So I kind of lump myofibroblasts and fibroblasts together for practical purposes in diagnostic soft tissue pathology, okay? So um, the reason I wanted to show this case is because this is a pretty big and cellular example of fibromatosis. There are some mitoses. Here's one right here. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the cellularity and the mitotic activity and the size of the lesion might make you concerned that this is something bad. You might even think this is like a synovial sarcoma or something. Synovial sarcomas sometimes can have areas that are like this, but usually synovial sarcoma, the cells are very closely packed together in, in some areas of the tumor at least. I have seen ones that had hypocellular areas, but usually you can find an area where the fascicles are very densely packed and the cells are crushed right up against each other, okay? So the, um, the separation of the cells by collagen in between, the way they're all running together in these very, very broad fascicles in the same direction, all of that's helpful. Look how wavy they get. Again, I told you that the fibroblastic tumors grow similar to dense regular connective tissue and they tend to get wavy like this um, as an artifact of processing actually. 
So the other thing to bring up is this. You look at areas like this, that doesn't look like fascicles of spindle cells. That looks like a bunch of round cells. Again, though, they're round cells, but they're not in a sheet like a round blue cell malignant neoplasm. They're each divided by collagen. And what we're seeing here is just a trick. This is the same as those fascicle areas, but it's cut 90 degrees. This is what happens if you cut straight across a fascicle. In cross-section, spindle cells will look round when you're looking at them on end, right? So that's an important thing. Like if you look at a carrot, long ways, it's going to be elongated. Cut it in half, it's a round circle, right? And I know that's common sense, but it can sometimes be very disconcerting it particularly I find in um, this setting of fibromatosis in the foot because the fascicles are so large that when you get a whole fascicle cut across, it's so many round cells that sometimes if you see this area first, you're not gonna think about fibromatosis at all. It looks like a round cell thing. So, so look around at all the areas and then if you start finding the nice fascicles, then you'll know, oh, those round cells are just, they're cut straight across here, okay? Instead of long ways. So that's a trick that I think confuses a lot of people. Fibromatosis in the palm, also known as Dupuytren's contracture, has the same features as this, but it's usually very small and very subtle and low on cellularity. Sometimes I get removal for a Dupuytren's contracture and I don't find any fibromatosis at all. It's just kind of fibrotic tendon and I don't see any parallel fascicles of spindle cells. But when you do find them, I find I usually they are very, very small in the palm. On the foot, the opposite is true. The foot fibromatoses are usually big. They're usually more cellular, kind of more hyperchromatic, I feel like, and they're usually more mitotically active. I don't know. I've wondered over the years if this is because people let them grow longer on the foot, because, you know, if, if something is on your hand, palmar fibromatosis usually causes a trigger finger, which is obviously annoying and problematic for your daily life. Uh, on the bottom of your foot, unless it's really painful or uncomfortable, you know, your foot still works, so you can tolerate it until it gets to the point that it's really annoying. Plus, I've had surgery on the bottom of my foot to have a nevus removed, and it was really uncomfortable, and it got infected, and I was on crutches for a month. So having a, um, something removed from the bottom of your foot is not um, always a, a walk in the park, okay? It can be really annoying and problematic. Um, so in any case, um, that is, uh, it's important, and I feel like over the years, I've seen people get really concerned um, about the plantar foot fibromatosis, which is also known as Lederhose's disease if you're into uh, old school eponyms. So just know that, that it's okay to have increased cellularity. You're gonna see some areas that look round cell depending on the cut. You can have mitosis. Somehow this myth evolved over time that fibromatosis should not have mitosis. I would say almost every case of like desmoid fibromatosis I see has occasional mitosis. I mean, it has to grow somehow, right? But uh, people get very uh, worked up and worried about that. I've seen many cases um, um, where people have sent in, in consult and said, well, I think it's fibromatosis, but there's mitosis present and that's okay. So someone asked, um, uh, is, should this be confirmed by IHC? Well, you certainly can. I would say that, so as you all probably know, Fibromatosis, desmoid fibromatosis is classically known to have nuclear expression of beta catenin, okay? And I have a whole video on my YouTube channel all about desmoid fibromatosis that shows multiple cases if you'd like. The problem with beta catenin is it's kind of a difficult stain to work with because it stains the cytoplasm of like everything. And cytoplasmic staining is totally nonspecific, doesn't mean anything. So what we need is to see nuclear staining, but in a thin spindle cell without much cytoplasm, when the cytoplasm picks up the stain, sometimes it makes it very difficult to see if the nuclei are truly staining or not. Also, in my experience, when you do get nuclear staining, it tends to not be 100% of the cells. It's like a subset of the cells that have visible nuclear beta catenin, and um, in, that's in desmoid fibromatosis. In palmar and plantar fibromatosis, they are usually going to be nuclear beta catenin positive also, although the molecular reason is different. In, in uh, desmoid fibromatosis, usually it's because of either the person has an underlying APC gene um, abnormality that's germline, or because they have an activating mutation in the beta catenin gene. And at least the last time I read about palmar and plantar, they do not have those molecular problems, although they do still have an increased expression of beta catenin. So beta catenin is, is activated some, uh, through some other method I'm not sure if people have pieced that out yet. Maybe, I mean, there's been a lot of new literature that I've not read on this topic, so perhaps. Um, but in any case, uh, you could do beta catenin, but I find that if you can't get to the diagnosis on H&E, beta catenin often will 
confuse you more than it helps you. Now, not always. I've had times where it really helped out a lot on a small biopsy, but I've seen times where it's made people want to call things, including myself, want to call things fibromatosis that it was actually just scar tissue um, or times where something looked good for fibromatosis and then one of my residents ordered beta catena and it was negative. And I thought, well, now what do I do? I think in that case, I just called it fibromatosis anyway, because it was classic on H&E. But the problem is, is that I think beta catenin is difficult to use, but you can try it if you have it in your lab. More important here, I think it would be totally fine if you wanted to do like a keratin or a TLE1, something to exclude the possibility of, of a subtle synovial sarcoma. That's totally fine because you can have subtle, small synovial sarcomas on the hands and feet. Um, that can be very small, even like less than a centimeter. That's well described in the literature. Um, and those tend to have a pretty good prognosis. But um, in a case like this, I've occasionally done some immunostains to make sure I wasn't missing a synovial sarcoma when it got really revved up. Maybe I did even on this case. I can't remember. This was from a long time ago. All right. So this is, uh, we, we have talked about it to death, but I think it's important because these are relatively common entities and they really can trick you because of the, the reasons we, we described. All right. But I think in general, um, you can usually diagnose them on H&E. And again, a little bit of that ramen noodle effect right here. See, it's wavy, not neural though, okay? Not neural. Right, so that's a plantar fibromatosis. Now, here, I can't remember the site. I think this is from the thigh of, a, of an older adult, an elderly adult actually. We see skin up here. But down below, we see a very large cellular tumor. And this was just the top of a very deep tumor. So another time where it's really rare to see this entity here with skin over top of it, because this tumor almost never occurs in the skin. I've never seen one primary to the skin. But every once in a while, a really massive one will grow up to the surface. Um, and so sometimes that happens. We have nodules. It's very cellular. And when we look closer, wow, look at the fascicle formation here. These streaming fascicles, kind of similar to what we saw in that last case, but much more cellular, right? The nuclei are very closely packed together. There's a little bit of intervening collagen, but really the, the nuclei are close and touching all their neighbors. And then look at the pattern of the fascicles. Instead of that broad sweeping fascicle, where was the area? I meant to annotate this slide and I forgot to. Well, I mean, it's all of it's good, but. I want to find the best area. This pattern here is what? You can type it in the comments if you want. I'll give you a second. I'll just give you a second to admire it because it is so visually appealing, even though it often means something bad, unfortunately. This is herringbone. Well done, uh, Fred Chen. Excellent. And Dr. Lenskaya as well. Yeah, this is herringbone pattern. And in the olden days, people said sarcoma with herringbone pattern was fibrosarcoma. With modern technologies, we know that true adult fibrosarcoma is a vanishingly rare entity. And the majority of things that in the early half of the 1900s were called fibrosarcoma with modern techniques, they end up being other things like synovial sarcoma, which is what this is, or um, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor or DDIF liposarcoma. I've seen herringbone in all of those things. I've seen melanoma with herringbone pattern and a wide variety of others. In fact, I actually, yes, fibrosarcoma is DFSP, Laurent Kiss said that, excellent point. That can, fibrosarcoma as DFSP can totally have herringbone pattern. So my normal rule is if you see herringbone fibrosarcoma pattern in the skin, you think of uh, fibrosarcoma as DFSP. This is one exception to that rule. Maybe I should have gotten a better section that was deeper down without skin. But in this case, this entire tumor, this was a big, deep uh, muscle mass that we just had pushed up. So on imaging, this was clearly a deep mass. And this was the wide local excision. And this section just had the very best um, microscopic um, morphology to show you the herringbone pattern. So the cellular um, area where the, where the fascicles run together or fishbone or chevron, you can use any name you like to, to, um, to describe this. But once you've seen it, it's like something where the, the, the fascicles coming together look like they're almost coming out of the screen or out of the slide at you. Like if you're old enough, like if you're old like me and you were around in the 1990s, there were these, these books called Seeing Eye Puzzles. And if you like crossed your eyes and looked at it hard enough, all of a sudden it would get three dimensional and you'd see like a ship or a race car or some shape. And I think that that's what this reminds me of. It makes me feel like, whoa, it's like coming out of the screen. It's got like a three-dimensionality to you. Even though it's a flat piece of tissue, it looks three-dimensional. So whatever visual works for you, that's what works for me. This is herringbone. So you can describe it how you want. Just know how to recognize it. 
Yes, so you have to think of a lot of different things and it is on my to-do list to make a herringbone extravaganza video to show you multiple different things that have herringbone pattern and that look very similar, but were totally different after um, uh, immunostain or molecular workup. So that's on my to-do list and I've actually started selecting slides for it. So keep a lookout, maybe that'll make it onto YouTube sometime in the next year, okay. So in this case, we have those, those herringbone fascicles. We also have dilated um, vessels in some areas. So um, you can get kind of a staghorn dilated vascular pattern. It's common in synovial sarcoma, but it's also seen in a variety of other things. Of course, solitary fibrous tumor can have dilated branching vessels. Um, also fibrous sarcoma is DFSP can. So what we would do here in this case, this is a monophasic synovial sarcoma, and it was positive for uh, keratin and EMA would be positive here. And if you do TLE1, that will be positive. And uh, like Dr. Wardleman talked to you about uh, in the last lecture, it can be a useful stain, but it's not totally specific, okay? So I do find that for one thing, it can be finicky to get working in your lab. And sometimes it can have some patchy staining if it's not titrated correctly. So you, I really wanna see strong uh, staining um, to, uh, to call it that. And um, a lot of times, if I have anything that is uncertain on the stain, I just go to molecular. And now there is a newer stain. There are stains now for the fusion. So synovial sarcomas are a fusion between the SS18 gene and one of the three different SSX genes. And now there's actually a, um, a two different immunostains to detect that fusion uh, product. And I've only recently started to have experience with them. And they in, so far have worked absolutely beautifully, really nice very crisp staining. Um, and that's just come out in the past uh, few years, I think. So it may not be in your lab yet, but if you, um, if you can get it, that stain is great. Or if there's any doubt, fish. Fish can solve the problem, get fish for SS18 break apart. So um, to me, if it looks really good and the stains work, I'm happy to make the diagnosis of synovial sarcoma on uh, without any molecular. But in any case where there's some uncertainty, molecular will solve the problem. And like Dr. Wardlin mentioned, remember that when you have a translocation associated sarcoma, usually you do not have pleomorphism. There are a few exceptions to that rule, but as a general rule, translocation associated tumors, all the nuclei look alike because they all have the same molecular abnormality, right? So you don't have random gains and losses like you have in aneuploid tumors like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma or pleomorphic liposarc where you get small daughter cells and big daughter cells when the mitoses divide. Here, you don't have that. You have a translocation that's driving the tumor and all of the cells have the same translocation. So the cells of synovial sarcoma to me are kind of more plump and oval. They, they touch their neighbors and they of course run with these herringbone fascicles and you will usually find mitoses easily. Here's a mite, here's a mite there. They're all over the place, okay? I have seen some less cellular kind of more lower grade, well differentiated kind of looking ones and those can be pretty tricky, but usually those were just in some area of the tumor and elsewhere there was stuff that looked like this. And of course you've probably learned about biphasic synovial sarcoma where you have little gland um, structures made by epithelioid tumor cells and then in the background is spindled and cellular like this. But I would say that I don't know what the exact rate is, but I see monophasic synovial sarcoma way more often than I see biphasic. So learn to recognize synovial sarcoma without seeing the glands. When you see the glands, uh, great, that's cool, but uh, recognize it based on the monophasic pattern, okay? So this was a synovial sarcoma. Oh, here, look. This is one of those areas I was talking about. See how this has more collagen in between? It's a little bit more pale, more spaced out. These can be pretty tricky. These areas kind of start like having overlap with that plantar fibromatosis I just showed you, right? It's not as cellular. So do be aware that you can have areas like this in synovial sarcoma, and that can be particularly tricky. I remember one case long ago on a needle biopsy, I did not think of synovial sarcoma at all. I actually thought it was gonna be like low-grade fibromyxoid or something because it was bland and hypocellular, it had some myxoid background. And then when the tumor was excised, no, it was totally synovial sarcoma. So um, you, usually it's easy to tell, but I have uh, had times before where it tricked me. So, and hey, again, look, ramen noodle, see it? So this is tumor invading through the fascia. It was coming up, I think, from the quadricep muscle through the fascia and obliterating the subcutis in this case. All right, good example of synovial sarcoma. And I have a few other videos about synovial sarcoma on my channel, including a long one that shows lots of different variations. So if you're interested in that and wanna see some different different uh, types of synovial sarcoma, go check that out if you'd like. Now, this is, uh, I can't remember the case number now. 
five, I think, whatever. The, you guys know what case it is. So here we have a mass. I think this was from a 25-year-old uh, uh, patient, and it was in their arm. So it's very blue and cellular. And look, it's got fascicles of spindle cells, and it's got areas of herringbone pattern. Looks quite a lot like that synovial sarcoma I just showed you in this area at least, okay? The one thing though that stands out, and it's kind of subtle, particularly this case is tricky, but there is a bit of pleomorphism here. So with practice, I think that you can begin to recognize that this tumor looks a bit different than synovial sarcoma. But I remember as a fellow, I thought that's impossible. I cannot tell them apart. And then over time, I learned some features that helped me. But this tumor right here is a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. It is another tumor that's well known for making uh, fascicular cellular fascicles with a herringbone architecture, but there are some other features that it has that can help you make the diagnosis. And of course, immunohistochemically, um, uh, we can sort this out too when needed. So the uh, one thing we have is in addition to the herringbone fascicles, look what we have here. We have other areas that are less cellular and more myxoid. The marbling or swirling together of cellular fascicular areas and loose, less cellular myxoid areas is very typical of malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Additionally, you'll often find a lot of necrosis. And you can have necrosis in a lot of different sarcomas, including synovial, but having these big zones of necrosis in the middle of the tumor, that's a very common feature um, in malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, MPNST is the abbreviation for that, or the acronym for it. The, um, in MPNST, the um, necrosis sometimes is very like geographic. You have these huge seas of necrosis and then islands of viable tumor kind of in the middle of all of this abundant necrosis. It varies from case to case. Um, the other thing I was gonna point out is this, and this is a trick Dr. Weiss taught me, and I have found this to be incredibly, um, incredibly useful, um, that in MPNST, you often have around the vessels, you'll see epithelioid, I am sorry that this thing keeps popping up here. How do I get, give me one second. All right, thank you. The, um, in, um, around the vessels, you have enlarged epithelioid change of the tumor cells that cluster around dilated vascular spaces. You can see it right here around these vessels, around these, around these. And Dr. Weiss said that she found that to be a very common feature in MPNST. And I have over time in the past 10 years of practice, um, or so I've, I've found that to be very useful and helpful. And look, more pleomorphism here. This is a lot more pleomorphism than I'd like to see for a synovial sarcoma. Synovial sarcoma is usually very, very uniform because it's translocation associated. So when you see that vascular change in a cellular spindle cell sarcoma, always think of MPNST. Not a totally specific finding, but a very useful clue. Um, okay, so that's another thing. And then look, these areas much more mixoid and loose here. More mixoids, see how the mixoid marbles together with the spindle areas. And then, oh, what's this? Well, those are axons. This is a big, deep nerve cut in cross section. And the tumor here is growing out of the nerve. So the most important thing I think to make, because um, MPNST doesn't have any one specific feature, it is a constellation of different features that help us to think of the diagnosis and arrive at it, okay? So all the stuff I just talked to you about, looking for any combination of those should always make you think of MPNST, but what really defines it? Well, the best ways historically to define MPNST and the way I still think is a very, very practical way to approach it is if you have a sarcoma that has some of these features, then ideally you wanna have one of three things be true. It is arising from a nerve. You can see it growing out of the nerve either microscopically or in imaging studies. Number two, it is growing out of a background neurofibroma, usually a big deep plexiform neurofibroma. Or number three, it is a sarcoma that looks like this arising in a patient with known neurofibromatosis type one, NF1. So if you have a sarcoma and one of those three things is true, is a very good chance that it's a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Okay, and more recently, there is a stain that can be very helpful, and it's called H3K27ME3. And I know that's hard. I had to practice it a lot of times before I could get it to roll off my tongue. It's a histone methylating protein, and it tends to be, it stains the nuclei of most tumors, but it's lost. The expression of it is lost in the majority of MPNSTs, especially in MPNSTs, it seems like that are outside of the setting of NF1. And that's really helpful because outside of NF1 is when it's really hard to make the diagnosis of MPNST. 
it's an important thing to an important tumor to recognize because these are quite aggressive and, and unfortunately often have a bad prognosis. So um, it's good to know about. But here, this tumor was actually growing out of the nerve. And I'll show you in a minute, there's actually a neurofibroma here too in another section. So it was growing out of the plexiform um, neurofibroma and this patient did indeed have neurofibromatosis type one, unfortunately. So a bad high grade sarcoma that unfortunately afflicts a significant subset of patients with NF1. One of the many reasons that NF1 is a very terrible disease and a very serious diagnosis to make. And this is why you should be very cautious about making a diagnosis of plexiform neurofibroma. I have a whole video about that and another video about MPNST. Pretty soon I'll have videos about everything and then I'll just won't tell people I have videos, they'll just assume yes, there's a video for it. But in any case, it's important because when you tell someone they've got a plexiform NF, you're basically giving the patient NF1 and this is the risk that comes with NF1. So really, and not to mention the 50% chance of passing it on to kids, it's a really serious diagnosis to make. So I never ever make a diagnosis of plexiform neurofibroma lightly. I basically want it to be definitively plexiform or obviously the patient has NF1 based on clinical workup. All right. So here's more of that marbling with the myxoid area. Really, really great example of that. And I think this one, I can't remember. I saw earlier, I was looking at the slide. I suspect this one may have a little area of malignant, um, of, uh, see these big cells? They're kind of uh, big pink epithelioid cells. I bet if we stained this, and I can't remember if we had done that on this case or not because it was a long time ago, but I suspect these would be positive for Desmond and myogenin, that these are probably rhabdomyoblastic differentiation in an MPNST, and when we see that, we call that malignant triton tumor. It doesn't make any um, difference in the treatment or the prognosis, to my knowledge. It is uh, useful to know, though, because sometimes when you have a lot of that, um, if, if uh, somehow if the patient's history is not known, a future biopsy might um, end in a misdiagnosis of, of rhabdomyosarcoma rather than, than MPNST. But in any case, it's kind of more of a pathologic curiosity, in all honesty, uh, rather than something that's needed for patient care. All right, so I put several slides you can go explore. This slide shows pretty much all the features here. Here's another view of the same thing. You can see there, this was the plexiform neurofibroma. And so that's why we have areas that look kind of like nerve and areas that are more um, collagen, little, little shreds of collagen. And we saw some residual nerve fibers and then, but it's all been overrun by the MPNST is growing out of it. Again, more myxoid change in here. And up here, another branch of that same large nerve, okay? Here's a good view of that nerve. And more of the same, and then I think on this last one, yes, here you can see this is the plexiform neurofibroma growing out of and expanding the nerve. Remember, it arises from the nerve, fills the nerve, and then kind of distorts the nerve over time. So you're still gonna find background nerve fibers running through the midst of a plexiform neurofibroma. It's just the nerve is way bigger and way more convoluted than usual because it's been distorted and filled by the, the, the neurofibroma. And then over here, it transitioned into the obvious high-grade sarcoma. You can see here's like neurofibroma here and then transitioning into the high, the high-grade malignant areas with big pleomorphic cells and mitoses. Oh, and the last thing, I like to harp on this a lot it, because there's a huge misconception that it's neural, so it should be positive for S100 or SOX10. In my experience, most of the time, you're either going to have totally negative SOX10 and S100 in a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor or only weak patchy staining, okay? There are some rare exceptions, and over time, I think some of the clones of S100 we're using have gotten stronger maybe, so there have been some rare times, but in general, do not expect to see strong and diffuse staining for S100 or SOX10 in a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor, okay? And if you do see something that you think looks like an MPNST and is strongly and diffusely S100 or SOX10 positive, that to me is I'm going to have to rule out melanoma before I ever call something MPNST, especially if you're in the skin. MPNSTs almost never occur in the skin, even in patients with NF1. I have only seen one example ever that I think had to be a true MPNST in the skin based on its staining pattern and appearance. Um, but that's the only time, I only one time ever. Um, so, but I have seen many, many times where people sent cases and said, I'm sure this is MPNST on the scalp of an 80 year old man. It's spindled and it's strongly positive for S100. And I was like, nope, that's a spindle cell melanoma. So I, I feel like that's an area that people are very confused about. And again, as you can tell, it's an issue I'm very passionate about. You can go watch my long MPNST video if you're curious um, to learn more. All right, so we have talked about that case ad nauseum, but it's an important and complicated topic that needs covered. All right, now the next case. 
this was a mask from a hand of a, a middle-aged uh, adult. And it kind of slowly growing and diffusely swelling the hand. And so they went in and took a biopsy from it. You can see dense connective tissue here and inflammation. But then in these pieces, there is a neoplasm. And it's sheets of large um, cells that have abundant pale pink cytoplasm, large pleomorphic atypical nuclei, and the chromatin is very pale and washed out, very vesicular. Look at how loose and open that chromatin is. Um, and these large pleomorphic cells with very pale chromatin and abundant dense pink cytoplasm on the distal extremity of a young adult or a middle-aged adult, what's this diagnosis gonna be until proven otherwise? What's the first thing you should think of here? You can type in the chat if you would like. And then some inflammation here. So this is an example of, I'll, actually I'll show you the stains first before we go further. And then we'll talk about it. Here's a keratin stain strong, diffuse expression of pancyter keratin in the cytoplasm there. Here's an EMA. Occasionally keratin doesn't work as well for this tumor, but EMA will. So I feel like it's, a, it's decent and reasonable to do both of them if you're suspecting this. And then further support, this is INI1, also known as SMARTB1. And you can see this is one of those uh, stains where negative staining is what matters, loss of expression in the tumor nuclei. And whenever you have one of those stains, whether it's one of the microsatellite instability markers or whatever, you have to make sure your internal control work really well. Because otherwise, if the stain fails, you could in, in, inappropriately consider it that to be a loss of expression, and then you could make uh, the wrong diagnosis. So I do think that INI1 is a little bit of a tricky stain. I feel like it should stain most of the nucleated cells in the body with the exception of the tumors that have INI1 or SMARC-B1 loss. But um, I do think sometimes, see, it's not like super strong, crisp staining in all the background cells. And this has been in multiple labs, I found this to be the case. But usually when it's lost in the tumor cells, it's obvious, look at that. You can clearly tell these big atypical cells are definitely negative when you compare them with the background lymphocytes, right? This is what you're looking for. Total wiped out loss in the tumor nuclei as opposed to the background normal control, okay? The, the endothelial cells or the inflammatory cells. So this tumor is of course epithelioid sarcoma and these often arise on the distal extremities of young adults, the conventional type. There's also a proximal type that is more ugly and kind of rhabdoid looking, very, very um, obviously malignant and uh, tends to occur uh, more proximally like in the groin or close to the trunk. Um, and in any case, these are important tumors to know about. They're very rare, but unfortunately they do often afflict young people and children as well sometimes. And they tend to be locally aggressive and eventually metastasize in many cases. So they're very serious diagnosis. And some cases can be quite subtle and kind of more spindle. They can ha have a low power appearance that has necrosis in the center with tumor cells around the outside that closely mimics rheumatoid nodule or deep granuloma annulari. So I always try to keep in mind whenever I see a rheumatoid nodule or a deep granuloma annulari, I try to always ask myself, could this be epithelioid sarcoma? I've just made that a habit to ask in the hopes that I never miss a subtle case. Because I have seen some subtle cases that were not this atypical that closely mimicked rheumatoid nodule and low power. And that is a really treacherous pitfall to fall into. So in any case, that's how we make the diagnosis. Remember that um, uh, INI1 is lost in a growing list of other tumors. You can go look that up online and see the list of various other entities that can have loss of INI1. So it's not a totally specific thing. It has to look like epithelial sarcoma, be the right clinical setting, and make sure that it doesn't fall into one of the other categories, okay? Um, also do remember that um, uh, about half of epithelial sarcomas can stain with, with ERG. And ERG is a great vascular marker. It's very sensitive and usually pretty crisp and clean, but it is not totally specific. It can stain a variety of other entities. So sometimes you are, it might have the differential between an epithelioid sarcoma and an epithelioid angiosarcoma. Both of them can be keratin positive and both of them can be ERG positive. So do keep that in mind that if you're thinking about a vascular thing, just remember that this will sometimes stain or oftentimes will stain with ERG and don't mistake this for a malignant vascular tumor, okay? 
So in any case, epithelioid sarcoma. And um, this uh, oftentimes, these a lot of times end up leading to amputation, not always, but unfortunately, a lot of times they do. In this case, the tumor was resected without amputation, and I don't know long-term how the patient did, but these do have a tendency to recur um, over time, sometimes over many years, can recur again and again, metastasize up the arm. I've seen ones that had kind of almost a sporotrichoid kind of pattern of cutaneous metastases. They tend to metastasize the lymph nodes, so they behave differently than a lot of other sarcomas, and uh, again, a really bad tumor. Um, here is the gross photograph of the resection of this case. That was the biopsy, the resection. This is what, uh, what it looked like, a very fleshy tumor here. And you can see filling up the subcutaneous adipose tissue and infiltrating down and mingling in between the, um, the fascia and the tendon sheath. And uh, obviously because of where these arise and because of how infiltrative they can be, can be very difficult to eradicate them surgically, which is why a lot of times Unfortunately, the patients do end up having to get amputations eventually. All right. Now, this is a patient with kind of uh, knee pain for several years and some difficulty of motion. And um, the surgeon went in and they, they went inside the knee and found that the synovium was completely thickened and had a shaggy appearance and was a dark brown to black color, right? So that's the classic description for what this is. And this is a really nice example of what this, this is, okay? This is pigmented villonodular synovitis, which is also known as tenosynovial giant cell tumor diffuse type, okay? When when diffuse tenosynovial giant cell tumor involves the, a large joint space and has this frond-like papillary projections filling up along the synovial surface, then you can call it pigmented villonodular synovitis or PVNS. And remember that this tumor exists on a spectrum with giant cell tumor of tendon sheath, which is also tenosynovial giant cell tumor, but it's the localized type rather than the diffuse type, okay? So while the low power looks very different here, when you have a large infiltrative mass in a big joint space, um, if you go to high power, the appearance between giant cell tumor of tendon sheath and PVNS is essentially identical, okay, or can be. So that's good. You can learn the high power features and then you can apply that and, and know how to diagnose both of those entities. Because again, the, the, the difference is just the growth pattern. Um, P, the diffuse form or PVNS tends to involve the large joints like the knee, but it can sometimes be in other joints. I've occasionally seen it in the hands and feet that was, it was clearly infiltrative. Um, and then giant cell tumor of tendon sheath, as you know, is usually on that, the distal extremities, hands and feet, but sometimes it can occur near the larger joints, okay? If there's any doubt, correlate with the radiology and what the surgeon's interoperative findings were to decide which form of tenosynovial giant cell tumor you're dealing with, okay? So the shaggy villus architecture is the, this is like such a great example, very dramatic, right? To see just how shaggy and papillomatous and, and frond-like this can be. But not every case is going to look like this. Some cases don't have nearly as much papillomatous growth as this case does. I also want to point out before we go to higher power that there are other things that can give you papillation or papillary growth of the synovium. Papillary synovial hyperplasia, which can be seen in association with arthritis and a variety of reactive things, can have papillary growth like this. But at high power, all you're going to see is papillae with some synovium on it, and you're not going to see the microscopic high power features that I'm about to show you. So do remember that. And there are other times where I've seen something that surgically was thought to maybe represent pigmented villonodular synovitis, but then on path, it was not. I've seen times where people had like hemarthrosis bleeding into the joint, and then they got reactive synovial proliferation secondary to the blood, and then tons of hemosiderin deposition. So it looked black and shaggy, but it microscopically didn't have the features of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. The reason the diagnosis is important is because it is a benign tumor, but benign doesn't always mean not causing a problem, right? This is a tumor that is benign. It doesn't metastasize. There are super rare examples of like malignant transformation. I think I've seen one ever like in training. I saw one, I think. Very, very, very rare. I do not even mention that in my reports because it's so like case reportably rare. But the, the bigger problem is that even though these are benign, they um, tend to recur and they often cause pain and mobility issues with the joint. So they can be a very morbid process for patients to have to deal with and, and uh, frustrating and problematic, okay? So let's see, I, I took the time to add some annotations here. Here are some of the features that I like. Now, I said this is a giant cell, okay? 
a tumor, a tenosynovial giant cell tumor. Obviously, you will oftentimes find a lot of giant cells, but some cases have very few or no giant cells. So you need to learn all of the other features before you worry about the giant cells, because otherwise, yeah, it's easy when the giant cells are present, but when the cases have no giant cells, then you're gonna be in trouble and you're gonna maybe struggle or make the wrong diagnosis. So first, let's go here. Hemocytorin deposition is often present, sometimes it's abundant, other times it's only focal. And again, you can see this both in PVNS and giant cell tumor of tendon sheath, okay? See, these fronds are lined by a synovial layer on the outside, but the middle of the frond is composed of the tumor cells with these histiocyte-like tumor cells and giant cells. Also right here, you can see, I can't go any closer on this one, maybe I didn't scan it high enough, but look, the tumor cell has a little ring of hemocytorin. There's a better example right here. Some people, I think, um, uh, like in the UK, call these ladybird cells. In the United States, we call la those ladybugs, but I think in the, the British English world, some people call them ladybirds because sometimes they have like the little head like a ladybug does and then a little body. I like to say that these have halos of hemocytorin. When you see these close up, and I have another video about this on my channel also that shows some real close views, um, which again, I, I think I didn't scan this at a high enough res, I'm sorry. But the, um, the ring of hemocytorin in these plasmacytoid histiocytic tumor cells, that is a very, very characteristic fe uh, feature that you see in tenosynovial giant cell tumors, both giant cell tumor tendon sheath and PVNS, okay? So look around for these cells that are kind of plump, have an eccentric nucleus, and then if you're lucky, you'll find a halo of hemocytorin. You don't always have those cells, but when you find them, it's very characteristic. But these big cells, these, these are large, puffy, uh, histiocyte-like cells with abundant cytoplasm, these can look kind of scary because they can be very big and mitoses are often readily identified and sometimes even abundant in tenosynovial giant cell tumors. And that does not mean they're malignant. It's totally fine to have brisk mitotic activity in tenosynovial giant cell tumors. All right. And so, but if you don't, if you don't know, and you see these big uh, epithelioid, almost looking histiocytic cells, and then you see mitotic activity, you can get scared and you can consider making a diagnosis of malignancy, which you don't want to do. Now, again, when you see the giant cells there, then everyone says, well, it's easy giant cell tumor, I can tell, because the giant cells are right there. But sometimes the giant cells are very few and far between or even completely absent. In those cases, the mitoses and the large uh, histiocytic cells can really make you afraid. And so those are the times where finding the hemocytor in the background can really help you. <clears throat> also, finding xanthoma cells you often will find bubbly, frothy, foamy histiocyte xanthoma cells, at least focally. You don't always see it, but you often will find them in tenosynovial giant cell tumors, okay? And um, the last thing was, here's an area I found. This is like an area, look, this whole area here, almost no, almost no giant cells. There's a couple at the edges here, but you can sometimes have very, um, uh, very large zones of these tumors that don't have any giant cells or very, very small little giant cells that are hard to see. So recognize all the other features, the hemocytorin, the foamy cells, the um, pigment uh, surrounding the histiocytoid cells, all of that stuff. And again, you can go check out my other video if you want to see more about this entity. These um, can stain with desmond focally. You can have scattered desmond positive dendritic cells in these, kind of unusual. I don't usually do that stain, but it, um, it is a finding you often see. And then histiocytic markers are often positive, but usually this is an H&E diagnosis. And because these can be mitotically active, guess what? They can be hot on PET scan. So I've seen these picked up incidentally in patients who had a different cancer and they were getting PET CT screening. And then a PET hot nodule shows up in a joint and then if you get a biopsy of that for rule out metastasis and you see these big cells and the mitotic activity, that's the time where you can get in trouble. And I've almost seen cases get misdiagnosed in that exact setting. So I was thankful. Mark Edgar, one of my soft tissue and bone pathology mentors, um, told me that yes, these can be hot on PET. And I've now seen that happen several times where these were incidentally discovered during routine PET CT scans on a, a patient with a different type of cancer. All right. This is, I'll say, this is a lytic uh, bone lesion in the cortex of a young kid. And it was discovered he had knee pain after, um, after a trauma and they did an x-ray and then they discovered this um, incidentally at that time while working him up. And it's a lytic lesion in the cortex, kind of eccentrically located um, in the distal, uh, distal femur, okay, near the knee. And when they went in and did a uh, biopsy of it, what we see here is a bland spindle cell proliferation with a lot of collagen in the background. And um, they look kind of fibroblastic. 
And also right away, you're struck by the enormous amount of hemocytorin pigment distributed throughout, and also lots of areas of foamy, xanthomatous looking uh, histiocytes. So putting those features together with the radiology, this is very good for non-ossifying fibroma, also known as fibrous cortical defect, okay? These are a very common benign bone lesion. And in fact, in some studies, um, they're incidentally seen in up to 30% of kids, all right? So these are very common lesions um, that just usually don't cause any problem. And so we don't know that they're there until they're incidentally discovered when the patient's having imaging for something else. And in fact, a lot of times I see bone lesions that are discovered that way. Patient had a motor vehicle accident, they got, you know, a scan for their, you know, their broken hip. And then also they find that there's a lytic lesion in the, the shaft of the femur or something like that. Okay. So I see that a lot. I also see times where people have a benign bone lesion and then they, it was big enough that they had a, a fracture through the lesion. And then that's when the tumor was discovered. So I've, I've found many times that's the way bone lesions present is that they are incidentally discovered or they're discovered once they fracture um, because sometimes benign bone lesions weaken the bone and then you can have fracture through them, okay? So here's some of the background bone. This was, as you can tell, this was not decalcified. That's why the bone's so purple and, and kind of crunchy and fragmented here. And then um, the other thing is the spindle cells can be kind of arranged in fascicles or they can have this very nice story form swirling arrangement here. Sorry, my screen's going a little crazy. So this kind of swirling story form pattern um, is characteristic of this entity. Occasionally, these can have big areas of necrosis that's like infarct necrosis, particularly if they fracture. And I've seen cases like that where it's kind of scary looking. They just have sheets of zonal necrosis, but the tumor cells are very bland and you don't see very much mitotic activity or anything else worrisome. So I have seen that before and um, that infarct can be scary. And they can also have scattered giant cells, sometimes even many giant cells, although this case doesn't really have many. So a really good example of a common entity and a very characteristic example of it, non-ossifying fibroma or fibrous cortical defect. Let me show you the radiology, not from this patient, but a different, let's see, here is, here's an example. And this patient is actually an adult. Um, here you can see this uh, lytic lesion. And the reason we know it's an adult is because they have a fused growth plate, right? Usually these are most common in kids, but sometimes you can discover them in adults as well. And you can see that the, lit, the lesion's lytic, it has these scalloped kind of pushing edges and the edges are dense and more dense white. They're sclerotic. They have an increased amount of bone around the periphery. So rarely do you see these completely removed on block. You would be able to see it on, um, on the pathology in that case, but usually these are curetted out or, or just a needle biopsy depending on the setting. But this, uh, this kind of uh, eccentric cortical lesion that has sclerotic scalloped kind of, um, kind of scooped out edges, you can see more of it here very characteristic. So a lot of times they're discovered and they, they don't always even biopsy them because they have such a characteristic look on imaging. So in any case, this is an example of one from an adult. All right, so almost done here. This is a patient, I can't remember the exact uh, clinical details, like the age, but basically they had a, a large uh, lesion in the bone that was, um, was uh, causing them symptoms or maybe they even fractured through it. And when you look, the bone is completely replaced by sheets of these large cells with abundant cytoplasm, not very much atypia, but just sheets and sheets of cells with cytoplasm like this. And the bone's basically kind of destroyed and replaced by it. So what are these cells and what does this patient have a history of that I'm not telling you? Does anyone know? Can anyone recognize it? This is something that I rarely encounter in practice. But a granular cell tumor is a great idea. No, that's not what it is, but that's a good idea. One thing that helps, the cytoplasm does look kind of the same color as granular cell tumor, but granular cell tumor, usually the cells all fuse together and make a syncytial sheet. Here, you can kind of see a discrete outline of each individual cell, like they have their own distinct cell uh, membranes. Let me see if I can find the area. I think I annotated a good area. Ah, uh, yes, here. Look at that. See this kind of thin little stripes and striations? Uh, yes, this is a storage disease. Very good. And this is uh, Patricia Barrios 
and Mirelle uh, Bolven uh, both get points for recognizing a, a storage disease. And yes, this is Gaucher's disease, um, which is something I rarely encounter. This is the wrinkled tissue paper, this kind of stringy fibrillary look to the abundant pink kind of fluffy cytoplasm. These are cells that are filled up. This is a liposomal storage, or oh, excuse me, a lysosomal storage disease and it's autosomal recessive, and the gene is beta glucocerebrosidase um, mutation that's autosomal recessive um, transmission. So we all learn about this in med school. I actually wrote down the gene because it's been a long time since I've talked about it. I want to make sure I got it right. Um, but we, we learn about this in med school, but it's something that I have not encountered very often in practice. And so what happens is because that enzyme is deficient, um, glucocerebricide, beta glucocerebricide builds up in the cells, in the, the phagocytic cells, um, and um, in the histiocytes, macrophages, also in osteoclasts. And because of that can cause a, a range of different problems, and there's several different subtypes, and there's a lot more to this disease. But I wanted to just show you an example because it's such a dramatic case. And, and I, I've read that they often do develop various bone problems. I think they can have avascular necrosis or bone infarcts and various things. I can't remember the exact setting here, but they knew that the patient had gauchets. They were removing this basically to stabilize the bone because I, either they had a fracture or an impending fracture, if I recall, because a lot of the bone was replaced by these uh, enlarged histiocytes that are filled with the, um, the material, the glucocerebricide. So a really dramatic example. And I always remembered that the pictures I had seen of these cells with the wrinkled tissue paper were blue. And that's because a lot of the times the pictures that you're seeing are from like a bone marrow biopsy when you're looking at a right heme sustain. So it's gonna stain the cells blue. This is what it looks like on H&E, on hematox, on an ESN. So I thought a pretty, a pretty great example of a un very unfortunate problematic disease. And finally, I think this is our last case. So I've gone over, um, you know, only half an hour, but since it's the end of the day, I figured, oh, well. And um, hopefully, thanks for any of you who have stuck around. Um, I probably should have only put like five cases here because I know how much I talk. So this is a mass, um, I think this is in a thigh of a middle-aged adult or a young adult, actually. And this is kind of an unusual pattern, right? There's a lot of collagen here. And then these uh, kind of hyperchromatic spindle cells that are arranged in either vague kind of loose fascicles or almost like kind of cords or chains a little bit. See how they're kind of running in elongated rows? Again, with a really dense sclerotic collagen in the background. There was an area, oh, no, maybe not. I forgot to annotate it. There was an area I saw in here that had some necrosis focally. There is a little bit of necrosis here, some individual tumor cells. And then in other areas, the, two, the tumor cells kind of make a different arrangement. They kind of arrange in these tiny little, little tiny nests almost, or little circles that almost have a little space. Kind of, they look like little micro alveolar structures maybe, or you could even start wondering, are they making like vascular channels, right? They kind of are clumping and clustering together in a strange way. And then there's abundant dense sclerotic collagen in the background. Does anyone have any ideas what this might, uh, might be. This is a, a kind of strange bird and relatively rare, but it's good to know about because it is an unusual pattern that might, you might not think of this tumor otherwise. Here, these are the areas that are kind of these little tiny microalveolar or pseudovascular structures. See, they almost look like vessels. What would you do if you had this case? What stains would you order? Any takers? So someone thought about, could it be a vascular thing like epithelial hemangioendothelioma? It is not, but that's a great idea. And I think even originally when people first started describing this tumor, there was a, a thought that, you know, could these be vascular tumors, but they don't stain like vascular tumors. So all the vascular markers would be negative here. But I'll tell you what is positive. And see, these are pretty atypical. At low power, not, not obviously, because it's kind of hypocellular, it doesn't strike you right away as definitively malignant, but as you look around, you see a lot more atypia here, okay? This is positive for Desmond and MyoD1 and focally for myogenin. So this is actually a rhabdomyosarcoma, an unusual variant called sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma, which kind of is lumped together currently in the current WHO with spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma. 
So spindle cell and sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma are important to know about because um, a lot of people are familiar with the other main patterns of rhabdomyosarcoma, but these are unusual and they don't look like the typical thing we think of rhabdo as looking like, right? I mean, you, would you look at this and think, oh, I should do a Desmond right away? Well, that's why Desmond is part of my basic workup panel. When I see a tumor and I think it's a sarcoma maybe or a malignancy and I don't know what it is, my initial panel usually includes Desmond, actin, actin's not the best, but it's helpful sometimes, Desmond and actin, S100 or SOX10, depending, and um, pancytokeratin. That's usually where I start. That can uh, help you a lot in deciding which road to go down if you're having trouble deciding how, what a tumor differentiation is. And uh, depending on the setting, I'll often add vascular markers too, okay? So um, here, this form of uh, rhabdo has a lot of sclerotic collagen in the background. It has pseudovascular channels or microalveolar structures. It can have cords and chains. That's the sclerosing form. The spindle cell end of that spectrum tends to have fascicles of spindle cells that look a lot like leiomyosarcoma or have the herringbone pattern, kind of like the fibrosarcoma herringbone pattern. So it's important to think of that. If you have something that looks kind of like a leiomyosarc, but it's a little weird, uh, consider could it be a spindle cell or sclerosing variant of rhabdo myosarcoma, um, especially in a child, right? If you think it's leiomyosarcoma in a child, always think of that, okay? So these kind of fall into a couple different groups. There's a, kind of a newer entity and some new data about it. So there's kind of genetically, there seem to be two different groups in this category. One is in really young kids or infants, okay? And those have a variety of different gene fusions. And I wrote down the list of genes. It's a long list. It's VGLL2, SRF, uh, NCOA2, TEAD1, CITED2, and I'm guessing that that's going to go on and have more genes added to it, but gene fusions, translocations, okay? That's in the infantile or pediatric form of the spindle cell sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma category. Those tend to have a relatively good prognosis overall. In um, adolescents and adults, these tumors, instead of having a fusion, they usually have mutations of MyoD1. The myo, say myo D1 that we use as an immunostain, that gene is mutated, not translocated, but mutated. And unfortunately, those tend to have a worse prognosis. All right. And, and they can it rise in the head and neck commonly, sometimes on the extremities in kids, uh, they particularly are more common paratesticular. So again, if you see a fascicle spindle cell thing near the testes of a child, think about spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma, okay? And um, usually my favorite stains for rhabdomyosarcomas of all type is Desmond and myogenin. I have found myoD1, it depends on the lab. I've had some labs where we really had a lot of problems with background cytoplasm staining, which made it very difficult to interpret. Um, my current lab actually has a really nice myoD1, but I like myogenin better overall, but this is one tumor where you need to know that myogenin is usually only focally positive in this tumor. MyoD1 tends to be the better stain in these tumors in the spindle cell sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma form. So if you have them both, you can do both, but just be aware that myogenin often is only focally positive in these. And of course, Desmond should stain them. So just know about this unusual variant of rhabdomyosarcoma that looks an awful lot like a vascular tumor in some cases. And I don't have one of the spindle cell variant ready to show you, but you can look up some pictures online and they really do have a very fascicular pattern. So important to know about these and, um, and keep them in mind. And sometimes the collagen in these can be so dense that it looks almost like osteoid. So you wanna make sure that you, you, know, you could start worrying if you didn't know, you could start thinking, man, is there osteoid production? Because remember, osteoid is dense collagen. So dense sclerotic collagen and osteoid, yes, they both can have overlapping features because they're both made of the same thing. So that can be really challenging, but that's gonna be a topic for a different video. So I think that brings us to the very end of the presentation. Again, it was an hour and a half or more of uh, weird bone and soft tissue tumors. Thank you guys very much for attending and for making the first day of this masterclass in pathology um, sponsored by Path Presenter, a huge success. We hope you'll come back tomorrow and uh, the next day to learn more from all of our other colleagues who have some really great material to share. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you again, Raj, for making this all happen. No, it's a team effort. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's like an effort by the entire faculty and all my colleagues to like, get this to this point. So thanks a lot. So let's go to the questions because I know it's a bit, little bit late for everybody. Uh, so let's start with the first question. Uh, the presence of ossification around reactive cartilage in the first case, can we use it as a sign of benign reactive condition? Well, um, yes, but it's not perfect, right? Because you can have 
you can have some calcification and even ossification happen around chondrosarcomas. And again, osteosarcomas will have mineralization and the chondroblastic form of osteosarc will have atypical cartilage. So by itself, uh, finding mineralization doesn't totally prove this, that, uh, that uh, a chondroid or osteoid thing is benign because you can have um, that in malignancy too. So yeah, you have to kind of piece together all the other things, the pattern of how it's growing, plus the radiology. And that's what makes these very challenging and why we spent so much time on this case because these are very difficult cases sometimes. Thanks a lot. So how would you distinguish fibromatosis with mitosis or atypia from fibrosarcoma or low-grade MPNST? So um, uh, for, fibroma, for a, a fibrosarcoma, like I said, is a vanishingly rare entity. The biggest thing for me is if I'm thinking of fibrosarcoma or other entities that look like it, I want to see fascicles that, number one, are cellular, right? The cells are packed closer together than in fibromatosis. And they are usually going to have at least, they're going to have more atypia. And then the other thing is that the pattern of the fascicles, let me go back to it. The fascicles here in a fibromatosis, either palmar plantar or desmoid, are very broad, right? They all kind of stream along together. You don't see that sharply um, interconnected uh, acute angle herringbone or fishbone pattern, which is the typical pattern you see in things. The herringbone pattern is what you typically see in fibrosarcoma and all of the other entities that can look like fibrosarcoma. So I have to tell you, I mean, I, I don't know if I've actually ever made a diagnosis of fibrosarcoma adult type or, or fibrosarcoma NOS in my entire career. Yeah, cool. um, and I just feel like it's it's vanishingly rare and it's almost always, if you think it's fibrosarcoma, it almost always is something else. The one, the exceptions to the rule, I guess I'll tell you real quick, is fibrosarcomatous DFSP, a variant, you know, of DFSP that gets the herringbone pattern and gets more cellular and mitotically active. So I'm, I will call that fibrosarcomatous DFSP or fibrosarcoma arising in DFSP is what some people say. So that's one time in infants, you can have infantile fibrosarcoma, which is a genetically, um, it, which is, it has a, a gene fusion, ETV6 and TREC3, which I would not make that diagnosis without proof of that gene fusion because it is a very good prognosis, has a very distinct behavior and treatment. So um, that is a known type of fibrosarcoma that happens in babies. And the only other time I really ever use fibrosarcoma is when it's part of the proper name of an entity, like sclerosing epithelioid fibrosarcoma or dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance. Outside of that, I feel like I, I just almost never would call something fibrosarcoma not otherwise specified. Because again, you will almost always be wrong. And I can't tell you how many times I see people online, I'll post an unknown case, and people online will say, oh, it's fibrosarcoma. If that is almost always the wrong answer. So that's my general advice to people. Don't call stuff fibrosarc because usually it's not what it is. It's usually something else. When we diagnose MPNST, should we always find a background of neurofibroma? Well, ideally, that's the very best situation because when you see obvious neurofibroma, transition to high-grade sarcoma, you know that that's MPNST. Like, but that's the definition of what malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor is, right? But I would say that, unfortunately, there are many times when we don't find that. When I find it, I feel more comfortable to definitively say, yes, this is definitely MPNST. Other times, um, especially before the advent of H3, K27, ME3, in the past, I would say a high-grade sarcoma suggestive of MPNST, if I couldn't prove that it was coming from a neurofibroma or arising from a nerve, or in the, and the patient didn't have NF1, if I didn't have one of those three things, those three criteria, then I would just say morphologically, this looks a lot like MPNST, but I can't prove it because I don't see the neurofibroma or a nerve or the NF1 patient. Now, if it looks like MPNST and I have loss of H3K27, I feel pretty comfortable making that diagnosis. Although I will point out there are some other tumors that can have loss of H3K27 ME3. Melanomas can have loss of it, so it doesn't help you in sorting out melanoma versus MPNST. Also, rarely D-diff liposarcomas can have loss of it. So I had a case once where I was debating between MPNST and DDF liposarc, and I did H3K27 and it was lost. And I did MDM2 and it was rearranged. Well, MDM2 rearrangements have rarely been reported in MPNST. So basically, I did all the workup and in the end, I still didn't know the answer. So I said high grade sarcoma and I'm not sure which it is. But yeah, I think a lot of times H3K27 loss is really helpful. Or if a tumor looks like MPNST and then I find rhabdomyoblasts that are staining with Desmond and myogenin, to me, that's like definitive for MPNST because. 
if it, because no, no type of uh, known rhabdomyosarcoma has all the microscopic features of malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. So if it has all the stuff I told you MPNST should look like, plus it has rhabdomyoblastic differentiation and it's an adult, it's almost certainly a triton tumor form of MPNST. So that can be really helpful to find the rhabdomyoblast that can help prove that something's malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. It's a really complicated topic and I have a long like hour and a half video just about MPNST and another like hour long one about plexiform NF and how to sort that out from low grade transformation to MPNST because it is so complicated and challenging, really a struggle. Oh, I think you're muted, Raj. Yeah, so I would highly recommend people to go to your YouTube channel because they can learn a lot from that actually. Thanks. And the rest of the questions, like because of the interest of time, we'll put it in the Q&A and then you can answer them on the, on the platform so that people can then look at the answers. Yeah. So thanks a lot for your time and thank you everybody for staying so late and uh, enjoying all these beautiful uh, and uh, like very well presented lectures and like we I think all of us learned a lot and tomorrow morning we'll start back at 9 a.m. with Dr. Victor Prieto starting off uh, with Milano City lesions. Thank you very much.